the computer science department. I work on topics in computer networking and internet security. And over the past many years, I've also been performing a variety of internet measurement topics. In particular, we measure the performance of the internet. We also have measured quite a bit about how uh, different countries, regimes, organizations censor or limit access to, uh, to content. So there are various forms that censorship can take. It can be out and out blocking, and I'll talk about that. But also there are some other, the, the other term I've used here is information control. And if a government wants to uh, control information, blocking is just one option. It can also do things like control what you can see or what comes back in your searches and things of that nature. Uh, Twitter, as we have seen, is quite a, quite a tool uh, recently, but we've actually been looking at that for, we looked at that several years ago, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we're trying to do there in terms of picking up things like propaganda in, in, in Twitter. Let me first talk about internet censorship in, in the uh, purest form and then talk a little bit about the techniques that we've developed to try to get a better handle on what's going on in various countries around the world. First of all, I should define censorship. Um, one, one way of defining it, um, which is necessarily fuzzy, censorship is a little bit of a vague, uh, it's a little bit of a value judgment <laughs> term in Computer science, we like to think about things uh, in binary or digital terms. You can get there or you can't. Um, and if you can't get there, it could be a failure of various kinds. It could be a packet loss. It could be a failure of a router or a switch. It could be an over-congested network. There are a lot of reasons why you might not be able to get to a website. So, um, and some of them are related to performance. When we use the term censorship, right, in, in a definition like this, um, obviously there's some value judgments and it. it sort of also bakes in this notion of intent, right, and it implies an intent of a government to basically control access. <coughs> when we talk about the number of countries around the world that practice some form of internet censorship, now you can count in various ways. But uh, various people have tried to count this. Um, and one of the things that we've been trying to do in our work is to, is to try to count it better. But let me, before I get to that, let me first um, t just put up some basic statistics. Uh, these are from uh, a group called the Open Net Initiative. Um, there are other groups that uh, issue reports of this nature, Freedom House, Reporters Without Borders. There are a whole bunch of... Um, uh, civil society organizations that release this kind of information. As you can see, there are a whole bunch of, uh, you know, there are a whole, whole bunch of countries, uh, you know, there are the, the famous ones, uh, if you will, uh, but actually, according to these reports, and I'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where, the, where those reports leave gaps, but according to those reports, censorship is practiced in, you know, at least, I'll say, 59 countries around the world, it's probably um, a lot more than that, and I think we should probably be updating these numbers based on our, our recent measurements. But th these, are, these are statistics and anecdotes from the Open Net Initiative's report. Um, it's not just the usual suspects. Um, we always hear about the usual suspects. Um, by that, I mean China and Iran, um, Saudi Arabia, et cetera, um, but also <coughs> There are Western countries that practice forms of censorship. Um, uh, Australia, the United Kingdom, to some extent, uh, there have been some incidents even here. Um, there are various reasons that a government might choose to block access to content, and I'll get into to those. Um, censorship does not, it's not synonymous with uh, dictatorship either. There are various electoral de democracies, such as those I've listed here, that have very significant censorship. Turkey has been in the news a lot, of course. Um, uh, South Korea also has fairly extensive uh, nationwide censorship. Um, one way that one can ex exert, or government can exert information control is by blocking access to websites and content, and I'll talk mostly about that in the hour. Uh, there are other 
things obviously that um, that governments can do. Uh, they can uh, arrest users. They can, uh, you know, so one woman uh, was sent to it. This is also from the Open Net, Net Initiatives reports. Um, you know, one woman, for example, was sent to a labor camp for a Twitter message. Uh, there was an, you know, uh, an Indonesian woman who was fined for an email, uh, you know, where she complains about a hospital. Um, <coughs> a lot of countries basically ban uh, these services that you, that we use a lot here: Twitter, YouTube, uh, online social media. Very sort of popular um, uh, category for for blocking. Again, these are all anecdotes, okay? I'll, I say anecdotes because we'll talk a little bit about how the Open, Nish Open Net Initiative compiles their reports. Part of the goal of, of uh, the work that my research group does here is to try to get, get us better data. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, there are various reasons why countries decide to censor. Um, I've cherry-picked a couple of articles here. Um, intentionally cherry-picking Western countries just to sort of underscore the fact that this happens all over the place, not just uh, in the places we often think of. Um, okay, so that's the sort of what and the why and a little bit of the how much. Uh, let's sort of talk a little bit about, oops, it's backwards. Let's talk a little bit about um, how as uh, engineers and computer scientists, we conceptualize censorship. Alice wants to talk to Bob. Um, let's say Alice is in some part of the network we'll call censored. By the way, in computer science, we often use Alice and Bob. Um, um, so Alice is in a part of the network that is called censored. You know, it's, it's censored. She might be in, um, uh, you know, for the sake of argument, we can say that she's in, you know, China or Iran. Um, but as I just pointed out, she could be anywhere. Um, point being, her communication is restricted by a firewall. Okay. Um, that also means, by the way, that Bob can't talk to Alice, right? So uh, the sensor can take a number of uh, actions to try to discourage Alice and Bob from communicating. Okay. Um, one is that the sensor could just block the traffic or filter it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that happens in a little bit. But that's one way, it's just blocking. Now, where this gets really kind of tricky is that there are other things that the sensor could also do. As I've alluded to with a couple of my anecdotes, um, sensor could also punish a user for trying to access content, right? So um, uh, in addition to disrupting the communication, a sensor could or a country could perform surveillance. That's also been a topic that showed up a lot in, in, in the news recently. Um, and by virtue of seeing Alice tr attempting to access a website or communicate with someone that the government decides that she shouldn't be communicating with, the, she could get in trouble for that. <coughs> Gets more complicated than that. We can get into you know performance degradation and other things like that, but for for to, you know for the purposes of a brief lecture, let's sort of just keep those two in mind. Um, how does it get done? Um, I'm going to give you like a, a nerdy um, measurement cartoon here, um, just to give you an example of uh, you know one example of how this happened. Um, this was the internet censorship event in Egypt in January 2011. Um, what happened in this case is um, there, so Egypt, the way that internet connectivity works is that Egypt has a bunch of networks, right? And the rest of the internet reaches those networks when those other, when those networks inside Egypt advertise that they're on the internet, right? So um, each one of those Lot, those colored lines represents what's called an internet service provider in Egypt. So Egypt has five internet service providers. And the height of the line basically represents how many different networks inside the country that ISP is, is telling the rest of the world about. Um, the point here, as you can see, on the x-axis we have local time. In the matter of about 30 minutes, um, and this was a, basically 
what Egypt looked like to the rest of the internet. Okay, so at 10 o'clock um, UTC, all five of these net, uh, networks, ISPs in Egypt were advertising, you know, that they were there to the rest of the internet. Within the span of a half an hour, all five of them went bye-bye. Okay, so this is one way that internet censorship takes place. You can go in and basically mess with the networks, and in this case, um, it was actually the, the internet routers. Um, uh, so th this, uh, this was a rather extreme case because the entire country essentially was taken offline. Uh, in this case, I don't know if anyone remembers, but this was, Egypt was offline for, for days, actually, uh, while this was going on. This is really, really extreme. Uh, typically, we don't see this. Um, there, occasionally, there are cases of fairly, you know, broad strokes and hatchets, uh, you know, taken to internet connectivity, but often it's a lot more fine-grained and a lot more dynamic, which brings me to the, the, the next part of, the next level of detail I want to get into in the talk. Um, this gets into some things that, that uh, we are studying here uh, in the computer science department at, at Princeton. The first, and I'm just going to talk about one uh, specific mechanism, um, is I'm going to talk about one specific way of doing scalable continuous measurement of internet censorship. So the idea um, here is when we go back to those numbers that I first presented at the beginning, the colored map, right? How did the Open Net Initiative get those numbers? How did they decide to color? an entire country red or yellow or purple? Well, typically what they do is they send activists, people like you and me, into those countries and they carry their laptops or you know, maybe it's a Raspberry Pi these days or something, right? They plug it into the, you know, into the network, they try to access some websites and based on what they get back, they write a report and there it is for the year. Um, that has a number of problems. Uh, one is you're sending activists into countries. Um, another is um, that it's a very limited data set, right? So you're getting data for that period of time, be it a couple of days or a week or what have you, when, um, when that person was in the country, but you're not getting continuous measurement, right? So typically what these organizations have done is said, oh, there's an election in Burma next week. Let's send some activists over to Burma and get, gather some data. And oh, lo and behold, there's some, you know, some sites are blocked. Oh, no. Um, except we don't have a baseline, right? We don't know what the internet looked like before the election or after, right? So we want to basically get more meaningful baselines. The other thing that, you know, any political scientist, including uh, many of the political scientists who study these kinds of things here at Princeton will tell you, is that censorship is a lot more heterogeneous than just all of China behaves in a particular way or all of this country behaves in a particular way. As we can even see from this plot, right? This was Egypt. That was like the most extreme kind of kill switch, right? And you can even see there are five different ISPs and they all kind of went poof at slightly different times. But if we get to sort of the day-to-day -day of individual sites being blocked, right? Different ISPs are going to implement this in different ways, uh, and um, they may also not. So, if you get a policy directive to uh, censor all hate speech or you know um, things related to the ANC or you know whatever it may be, every ISP is going to implement that a little bit differently. There's, typically, they don't get you know the governments don't get prescriptive into um, you know, block lists. Um, there are maybe some exceptions to that, but um, uh, by and large, the ISPs are left to their own devices. The other thing that the uh, political scientists will tell you is that countries, of course, are not uh, homogenous, right? We know that about the United States, right? New Jersey's not quite the same place as Texas. Um, same thing with China, right? Uh, different provinces have different um, politics, different behaviors, etc. And as a result, there are different kind of filtering regimes that are known to exist. We want to measure those. So let me talk a little bit about that first. Then I'm going to talk about the other two points on the slide. Okay, so um, 
we see stuff like this all the time, right? And the issue is that everything I've told you so far is anecdotal. Uh, and I would consider the activist scenario to be anecdotal as well, right? It's, you know, I want to see what's going on. I gather some data. Hey, this terrible thing happened to me. I tried to access a website and it was blocked. Except, well, what, is it, what does it look like all year? And what does it look like, you know, in the east, eastern part of the country versus the western part? And, you know, how does this, how does this change um, over time? So we want, and, and by the way, how is it being blocked is another question. There are many different ways that a site could be blocked. Okay, so we want to move beyond anecdotes to say, okay, well, actually, um, it's not just Iran being orange or purple or whatever. It's, you know, Twitter is censored in Iran and it's censored like from these months and, you know, these, you know, these times from these different, you know, internet service providers and it's censored with a block page, right? You might get a page that looks like that. But there are different ways that you could block things too, right? You could get nothing, right? You could get a page that says you've been blocked. You can get redirected to a, you know, Iranian version of the site, for example. Uh, so there are different ways that, that blocking could occur, and we want to basically shed light on that. Okay. Um, unfortunately, this is really tricky. Um, Moving beyond these anecdotes is, is challenging. There are many different languages, um, uh, locations, and cultures, and recruiting a lot of vantage points uh, is tough, right? If I were to say, um, hey, if you can just please go measure, uh, you know, measure the internet from 100 different places in China um, right now, you'd have a hard time doing that, right? Um, you don't have 100 different vantage points, you, you may not speak the language. Um, you probably don't know, uh, you know people who are willing to go do this for you. Um, and even if you were, you'd have a hard time keeping them over there forever. Um, so there are, um, and then the other thing, of course, is diversity, right? There are many different ways that uh, censorship can be implemented. And, um, and therefore, we need, different ways of impl uh, we need different ways of implementing the measurement. Since uh, this is just a short lecture and not a full class, I'm not going to sort of talk about all the different ways that we do this. Um, but I'll give you one. I'll give you an example of, of one way that we do this, um, and then I'll I'll leave the others for for an exercise. Um, we built a tool called Encore. Um, the way the tool works is um, instead of requiring measurement vantage points to, to exist in, you know, for us to set up measurement vantage points in a country, we can actually set up a website that we control, <coughs> and then when a user visits our website, right, which hopefully isn't censored, um, then scripts on that site induce the browser the, the, in Iran to load another object from a site that we're interested in getting information about, like Twitter. Okay, so um, there's some nitty gritties on this slide. I'm not gonna get into it. Um, uh, there's, the details here don't matter for today. The way to think about this is if you, um, it's, it's basically the same way ads load on any web page that you visit. So if you go to the New York Times or CNN or your favorite news site, not all of the content is coming from CNN's web server. It's coming from ad sites and trackers and, you know, if there's a Twitter share button on that site, that button is actually being loaded from Twitter's server. So we're doing the exact same thing here. We're creating a web page and we're embedding some content from Twitter on that page causing the browser to basically load it. The technical challenges here, so there's some technical challenges and there's some ethical challenges with this. Um, again, it's a, sh it's a short time today, so I won't, um, you know, I won't belabor everything. But let me just briefly mention, the technical challenge here relates to uh, the way that web security works. Just because we add, just because we ask a browser to load content from another site doesn't mean we get information about how well that load actually happened. We actually can't see that data. Um, so the, there's basically a side channel here that we exploit to figure out 
we're over here, whether or not this succeeded or not. Okay, so I'm not getting into the details of that today, but it's actually a little bit more challenging than it might appear to, if we're at the top over here to actually figure out whether or not this, this works. Um, I'll leave you today with just the upshot, which is that we can do it. Okay. Now, even if we can do it, there's a question of should we be doing it? Remember if we go back to the, the question of the, or the setup at the beginning of the talk where we had the Alice and Bob and the sensor, and one of the issues was not just that the sensor could block the communication, but that the sensor could punish Alice for trying to access a blocked site. Now, this is a really tricky eth ethical question because um, if you read the laws in any of these countries, which I haven't read the laws in all, you know, 180 countries where we could potentially do these measurements, but by and large, it's not illegal to access content um, that's blocked or attempt to access it. It's certainly going to get you in a lot of trouble if you try to publish, uh, you know, things that are, that are forbidden. However, just because something is not illegal does not make it safe, okay? Um, so that puts us in a very um, thorny ethical quandary because if that user over there on the left is in Iran and we're causing their browser to load something that we suspect might be blocked, then we're potentially putting the user at risk. Um, so we've spent probably an equal amount of time on this project um, unpacking the ethical questions as we have trying to figure out how to make this work technically. Um, <coughs> working with some of the folks in uh, sociology here uh, who, um, who, who Matt Soganik in particular has thought a lot about ethics and data science and has helped us kind of reason through how to do this and other similar kinds of experiments in ethical ways. Um, the upshot of this is that in, in, with this and two other techniques, similar kinds of techniques that we've built, uh, we are able to get continuous measurements on filtering of the web from about 180 countries worldwide, and we've been doing this for about two years. Um, there are two other ways that are common for blocking content. One is based on the name itself, right? So this is sort of at the level of a web browser, you could block any attempts to look up the name facebook.com or google.com. That's a different internet protocol and we have another scalable way of measuring that, that kind of blocking. You can also block what's called an IP address. Um, and again, uh, there's, a, there's a third technique that we've developed to do that. Um, so for the first time in forever, um, we now have the ability to get continuous data on filtering from hundreds of countries around the world uh, and many, many vantage points within each one of those countries continuously. Okay, this is all open source by the way, uh, this and the other projects uh, that I mentioned. Um, so if you're interested in um, uh, adding to it or testing it or seeing any of this data or working with it or helping out, I welcome your participation, enthusiasm, uh, contributions, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Particularly, I would, I, I'm speaking to the undergrads who are looking for independent work projects and theses and things like that. I think this is a, um, a fantastic topic, very ripe. The data that we've, that we're getting now is, is, is yeah, we're, it's very fresh. Okay, and the last, um, I guess the next topic I wanted to talk a little bit about was um, uh, manipulation and propaganda. Okay, so in addition to um, outright blocking of content, as, as we can see now, um, there are other mechanisms that a government can use to try to control uh, sentiment to try to control public opinion and so forth. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing it happen here too. Um, okay, um, and not just recently, by the way. I think um, you know Twitter is certainly in the news uh, every day now, uh, but this is not a 
uh, particularly new phenomenon. There, we studied this, some of these things back in 2011, 2012. Um, actually, now I look at this, 2010, when um, you know, there are political debates going on all the time. Uh, two that we looked at, um, let me come back to that slide in just a minute. Two that we looked at were a Senate race, and uh, as happens every few years, a debt ceiling debate. Um, this was the debt ce the great debt ceiling debate of 2011. I guess it wasn't the great one because this one actually never caused the government to shut down. But um, so um, <coughs> the question that we were interested in studying was how the use of Twitter can be used in different ways to affect public opinion, and can we detect when Twitter is being used to sort of spread "Quote unquote propaganda." I should put. I should have put propaganda in quotes there. Uh, I'm going to sort of define that in a particular way in just a minute. Um, let me first define two other terms, which are sort of more broadly accepted. One is sock puppeting. Okay, I don't know how have people have heard of this. Only, uh, one person. So this is basically. Uh, so if we if we look on Twitter, for example. Um, there might be an appearance, you, you might get the impression by following, you know, someone's Twitter account or watching someone's Twitter account that um, that's an independent person speaking, right? Now, if you see 20 people saying, you know, the same thing, let's all raise the debt ceiling, for example, um, then you might come to the conclusion that there are a lot of people who are, you know, in favor of that, right? Um, on the other hand, all of those actors may not be independent. They may be controlled by a political action committee or you know, lobbying organization or what have you. So sock puppeting is, is the appearance that you've got a whole bunch of independent actors saying things when in fact those actors are in hock to some other uh, puppet master, shall we say. Um, the other um, phenomenon that we commonly hear discussed is this notion of astroturfing. As the name would suggest, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with AstroTurf. I don't know if it's even, yeah. Does it, I don't know if people, if that term is even still used. Fake grass, basically. So um, this is a sort of false appearance of a grassroots movement saying like, oh yes, um, you know, uh, this was, you know, if we look at say the, you know, um, Senate race, for example, um, it might be something like, you know, um, you've got a whole, you know, um, soccer moms for, you know, Senator Smith or something, right? And then uh, you've got, you know, the PTA and this, you know, this group and, you know, all of a sudden it might appear that you've got a whole bunch of organizations who are rallying around, uh, you know, uh, a particular issue or candidate or uh, position, uh, but in fact, under the, you know, Behind the scenes, you've got an orchestrated movement. It's all controlled by, you know, Steve Bannon or somebody, not to name names. Uh, but, um, for example. Um, so, um, question is, you know, how can Twitter be used, you know, to affect public opinion? And can we actually detect when such a thing might be taking place? Okay. So, what we tried to do in, in this work is, for, so first, we got to define propaganda, and that's a hard thing to do, and we're computer scientists, so um, we're not particularly good at defining English words. Um, uh, that's, I guess that's a, a whole research topic in and of itself, is what is propaganda. The way that we looked at this problem is to take an issue like the Senate race or the debt ceiling debate, and both of those issues or, or races have effectively a dipole. You have, you have uh, a position on each side, right? You have for raising the debt ceiling and against. And you have, you know, the GOP candidate and the Democrat candidate. So now if each of those endpoints represents a point in your Twitter follower graph, now we can start to do analysis of the graph and see, well, who's following, you know, the GOP senator, and who's following the 
uh, Senate candidate. Who's following the Democrat Senate candidate? And now you can start to see basically in this graph, Twitter accounts basically um, attaching or affiliating to one side or the other. So for any one of the, any particular account, um, we can see, well, how close is it to one dipole or the other? And you can look at some that are maybe more, you know, more in the middle. Um, this is how we labeled, okay? This is not really, um, this is not how we detect it. This is how we basically said, how extreme is this point in the graph, right? How close is it to one side or the other? And then we defined sort of a, we defined propagandist as a point in this graph that's closer to one extreme or the other. In other words, some account that, you know, probably has a position on the matter, okay? Based on who they tend to be following. Now the question then was, are the accounts that are following, you know, one side or the other of this debate um, and uh, spreading information, do they behave differently than your typical Twitter user, right? Um, okay, and by behave, I mean, what are their tweeting patterns look like? So um, you could study this problem in a number of ways. You could, for example, look at the language being used in the tweets. We don't do that. Uh, that's a different area of computer science called natural language processing, and I, as I mentioned, work in computer networking, so we study network traffic patterns. So the methods we're looking at here are things like rates, how fast is someone retweeting, how, you know, how often, you know, what are the volumes, et cetera. Okay, so as you might expect, there are a whole bunch of different um, uh, uh, be characteristic behaviors of accounts that sit at one end of the dipole or the other, and I've put them on the, on the slide here. <coughs> if you look at any one of those accounts, it has a higher fraction of retweets. Uh, there are bursty tweets. I guess this sort of begs the question of... Uh, <laughs> Got some other bursty tweet, bursty Twitter accounts these days that are, yes. Anyway, um, we did this in 2012. I'll add um, uh, higher daily volumes and also sort of the if you look at the amount of time that you know an initial tweet goes out versus when it's like retweet. Some of these sort of uh, you know prop, what we call propagandist accounts are retweeting very very quickly. Okay. Um, whether or not they're bots, we can't say. Um, you know, we didn't look into that. It would be, it, you know, there's probably a separate study that could be done to try to automatically identify as a human behind that. I actually don't know how to do that. Uh, but certainly we can figure out this Twitter account is being used for not much except to just, you know, act as an amplifier or a megaphone. Okay. So um, I think. One other topic that I, that I want to raise, and then um, uh, I don't know, yeah, I, I think I'll just mention one other topic that we've studied, uh, which is this notion of a, of a filter bubble. Um, actually, I have a video I, I can show that as well and, um, uh, related to this topic. Um, how many people have heard of the filter bubble? Okay, so, um, so I probably don't need to belabor it. Um, but the idea, for those of you who haven't heard of this, is that all these sites and services, uh, et cetera, such as those I'm showing on the slide, uh, are becoming increasingly personalized. And as a result of that, your view of the Internet's going to be a lot different than mine. Okay. Now, um, we can talk about the pluses and minuses of, uh, of personalization, but there's another twist to that, which is that actually... Uh, personalization can be exploited and attacked. So let me just quickly show you a video of that. <clears throat> Where are we? Oh, perfect. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to show you an, an example of um, search personalization. Okay. So we know about search personalization, right? Based on you know, where we are, what, what city we're in, our location, stuff we've searched in the past, you know, Google might send us different search results based on, you know, you know, so that when I type in shoes, I'm going to get, you know, 
some running shoes and you're going to get uh, stilettos, right? Well, um, great, except one of the things that, um, that can happen is that personalization can be attacked. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of that. Okay, so here we've got a user typing in shoes and, uh, oops, uh, I'm having a hard time seeing it down here. Let me see if I can get, okay, there we go. Right now, the search history is empty, okay, uh, except for shoes that we just typed in there. Um, what this user is showing here is just their set of results that are coming back. All looks very interesting. We're looking for a result in particular. If we go to the second page here, um, we're looking for Macy shoes. Oh, there it is. Okay, so that's on page two. Okay. So, note, Macy shoes showed up way down the list. This particular attack, uh, I'm going to stop it right here. Uh, this particular attack is going to take that Macy shoes item and move it up to the front page for you as the user. Okay, well, how do we do that? Uh, it's possible to pollute a user's profile. Okay. Um, here, let's suppose that I've convinced you to come to my uh, lovely site. It's got a picture of a, a cupcake. It's harmless enough. Beautiful. Um, okay, you've come to my site. Now, um, the interesting thing is if we look at our search history, we refresh that. Okay, oops, what just happened? When we go to the search history, right there, suddenly there's other stuff in there that, I, that you didn't type. Wait a minute, so there's Macy, Macy's women's shoes, Macy's shoes. What's going on here? Okay, well, what happened there was when you went to my seemingly innocuous cupcake site, actually there were scripts hidden in the back, right? And you're logged into Google. How many people log out of Google, by the way? Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, so, uh, what one can do, right, and what happened in this attack is you visited my site. My site had a script that actually caused your browser to um, actually make some requests to Google, uh, to Google search engine in the background. Didn't show you the results, uh, but they went into your search history. So now I basically polluted your history, and I probably don't need to show the rest of this, but just to kind of finish the story, when, when now when you come back and you search for shoes, uh, your results are different, and you'll see very quickly here that we've managed to move Macy's right there up to the first page. Okay, so there are different versions of this, this attack uh, with, with varying kinds of results, but that's one kind of example of how um, scripts and other things, you know, running on the internet can be used to kind of attack uh, something seemingly innocuous as, as personalization. Obviously what we want to do is develop defenses against these kinds of things, so one thing that we can do, of course, is expose uh, inconsistent results. Right? So we've built a tool to do that. Um, we can take a query that a user, so this might be a Chrome or a Firefox plugin, take a user query, execute it uh, at, on different machines, right, from different vantage points, and see what kind of answers are different profiles and different users getting in different places and compare them. And at least tell you what other users are getting. So we built a tool to, to, uh, to do that. Um, that not only shows, <coughs> not only shows, so here's, you know, an example of, you know, searching for Jennifer Rexford, a professor in the computer science department here. You know, here are my results, but the plugin basically gives you some additional information about, oh, here's some yellow links, and by the way, other people got these links, and you just happen to not see them on your first page. So one of the things we're trying to do is increase transparency of, you know, when this kind of, manipulation occurs, you know, give users a better sense of when it's actually happening. Uh, we've done this for search. Obviously, there are other places where this is um, going to be necessary. Um, news being a, another particular example, we've done some, some early work in that. That's another area where, again, speaking to the students in the, in the audience, really interested in exploring these kinds of effects of personalization and um, filter bubbles, if you will, in you know online news, uh, so that's something you're interested in 
please feel free to, uh, to come talk to me. So again, um, my name is Nick Feemster. I'm a professor in the computer science department here. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks for having this event. I think it's a fantastic uh, day. Uh, thank you for inviting me to, to participate. I was very proud to, to be able to contribute. So I, I have to step out, but maybe I can take one, one question as I'm, as I'm packing the bags, if there are any questions. Sure, yeah, let's take one question. Three countries have arrested people for online activity. According Did, to the Open Net Initiative, yeah. Does that include the U.S.? Has the U.S. arrested anyone? I don't know, actually. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think it, it probably depends on... Uh, I, yeah, we're on camera here, so... <laughs> I, 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 better, I better leave that open, actually, because I don't know the authoritative answer. One. One can basically speculate and de define that in different ways and probably come up with an answer either way, though. Yeah. It's a good question, though. <laughs>